right, good morning. Good morning. Great day to be a missile defender, right? All right. General Ham, thanks for that uh, great introduction, and thank you and uh, AUSA for uh, putting on this forum uh, for us today. You know, I about a year ago, I got the opportunity to do the first one of these and uh, for me, and uh, very informative. This is a great venue. When I look at all the folks that are here today, not only the active folks, but as well as our uh, industry partners, as well as some of the folks that do some heavy thinking about this uh, enterprise and this, the threats that we face today around the D.C. area, it's great to have everybody together. I'm excited about the panels that we've got uh, set up today. I'll talk a little bit more about those as I go through my remarks, but uh, all in all, I think we've got a great agenda set today, and certainly, General Hyten, thank you for being here today. I know how extremely busy you are every day, but in particular this time of year with everything that's going on across the river uh, in terms of testimony and testimony prep. So, sir, thanks you for being here today, and really my objective is to try to get through my remarks as quickly as possible because I know everybody here is very anxious to hear uh, your comments, sir. So the theme, as uh, General Ham mentioned briefly for today in this pro uh, professional development forum is Army Air and Missile Defense, ensuring readiness today and building greater capabilities and capacity for the future. Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense has been and will continue to be a core capability that the U.S. Army provides to the Joint Force and our coalition partners. This portfolio is now one of the largest in the Army budget, and given the growing international threat of sophisticated rocket and missile technologies, integrated air and missile defense will be vital to our na nation's overall defense capability for the foreseeable future. So air and missile defense, is no surprise, is one of the Army's top modernization priorities, and enhancing our layered missile defense is specifically called out in the national security strategy, yet our air and missile defense forces are still a low-density, high-demand resource. We are globally deployed and regionally engaged as a key strategic enabler for the joint force and the nation, and we are facing some of the toughest challenges that I will briefly summarize in my remarks. Of course, one of these challenges is the evolving adversary threat. The national defense strategy acknowledges while the United States' competitive military advantage has been eroding, we face an ever more lethal and disrupt disruptive battlefield combined across domains and conducted at increasing speed and reach. The new defense strategy recenters our focus on long-term strategic competition, particularly regarding China and Russia. It also cites growing threats from rogue regimes such as North Korea, which conducted 21 missile tests last year and with a total of almost 70 since the leader has been, Kim Jong-un has been in power. And of course, Iran, which continues to seek new missile capabilities. The range of threats keeps expanding. Air and missile defense systems will encounter more unmanned systems, more complex electronic, cyber, and directed energy capabilities, and other emerging threats, such as hypersonic weapons. We also face a changing operational environment, where U.S. supremacy is increasingly contested in all domains. The multi-domain battle concept is designed to provide advantage in this environment, and air and missile defense is integral to the Army's conceptual development of the multi-domain task force. After 17 years of sustained combat and continued budget unpredictability, another of our challenges is readiness. Readiness is the Army's top priority, a fight tonight mentality that demands the tools and training soldiers need to deploy, fight, and win across the entire spectrum of conflict. We have, maintain, we have to maintain readiness while more than 50% of our AMD forces are among over 178,000 soldiers currently supporting combatant commands in 140 countries, and the demand for air missile defense forces continues to increase. The current fight also impacts modernization, which the Army must balance with operational demands. Our efforts have to be synchronized between the operational and institutional parts of the Army, and we must have sufficient and predictable funding to succeed. And finally, our technical advantage is narrowing. The National Defense Strategy emphasizes delivering performance at the speed of relevance, and states success no longer goes to the country that develops a technology first, but rather to the one that better integrates it and adapts its way of fighting. We must fully consider all four AMD pillars, active defense, passive defense, attack operations, and C4I as we develop kinetic and non-kinetic solutions. Today's panels will focus on four lines of effort that we are refining for the next AMD strategy, and I will briefly mention some of our recent accomplishments when it, within each of these lines of effort. 
First, develop air and missile defense capabilities. Building capabilities to, to, to match today's threats is insufficient to tomorrow's threats. We need to aggressively leverage industry partners and others to identify and develop leap ahead capabilities. This panel will discuss what we fight with and how we fight, which is crucial to building the force over the next 10 years. We've had several achievements over the last years within this specific LOE. MDA successfully demonstrated the ground-based mid-course defense, intercepting an ICBM target. MDA also plans to conduct the first GMD salvo operational flight test next year. We anticipate adding a long-range discrimination radar in the 2020 timeframe. We continue to advance our interoperability. The Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense Program will integrate AMD capabilities by transitioning them into a flexible and agile AMD Mission Command Network using the IAMD Battle Command System to link Army and ultimately the joint AMD Mission Command Node sensors and launchers. Patriot modernization is on schedule. The Army is delivering the next Patriot software build, PDB-8, to its 15 Patriot battalions. The recent upgrade of the 1st Air Defense Brigade is a big win for the 35th ADA Brigade, as well as AMC. To address the Army's requirements for a pad, uh, Patriot AMD radar replacement, we are developing the lower tier air and missile defense sensor, or LTAMS. The LTAMS program is currently executing a concept definition phase in preparation for a milestone A decision. We are also developing a mobile ground-based weapon system called the Indirect Fire Protection Capability Increment 2 Intercept Block 1, which will acquire, track, and engage a, and defeat UAS and cruise missiles and is scheduled to begin fielding in the FY 2021 timeframe. Additionally, as a part of the block run program, an initial counter ram capability will be fielded in the FY 2023 timeframe, with Block 2 providing a full counter ram capability in the 2032 timeframe. For counter UAS, the Fire Center of Excellence completed a new strategy in ConOps last year. We are also developing and testing electronic warfare and directed energy technologies as potentially cost-effective solutions. The mobile experimental high-energy laser, a striker equipped with a 5KW laser, is one of those directed energy solutions. It has successfully engaged targets, including UAVs, doing two maneuver fire integrations experiments at Fort Sill, as well as the, the hard kill challenge put on by Gyoto last year. We are working at options for equipping a striker with a more powerful laser as we are fitting our high energy laser mobile test truck with a 50 kW laser for demonstration this year. We expect to test our 100 kW laser by FY22. And we are engaged in the new AMD cross-functional team. The Army recognizes that we need more innovation and agility in research and development. We have to leverage commercial innovations, cutting edge, cutting edge science and technology, prototyping and warfighter feedback. The National Defense Strategy stresses this as well. The CFT concept is to provide a more efficient, flexible, and responsive process to exp expedite decision-making for a potential program of record informed by experimentation and technical demonstrations, teaming, agility, and rapid feedback. Slide. The next line of effort provides sufficient AMD capacity to meet demand. You know, there is an old saying that quantity has its quality all of its own. Adversaries continue to invest in numerous relatively inexpensive capabilities like ballistic missiles. Our systems, like THAAD and Patriot, are very capable against those threats, but we have relatively few of these low-density, high-demand assets. Today's panel on this LOE will discuss how the future AMD force will be structured and organized to fight to meet future demands. In response to the Chief of Staff of the Army's number one AMD priority, we initiated a MANPADS pilot program for the short range air defense for maneuver forces. This initial shore ad capability consists of ground maneuver MANPADS, MANPAD teams trained to protect maneuver forces. To date, we've trained 208 soldiers, which is equivalent to 104 MANPAD teams, providing capability to UCOM and FORCECOM a very significant accomplishment for the Army's Fire Center of Excellence along with the Army staff and all the troop units that were involved. For the ground-based mid-course defense, we increased the number of interceptors last year by 14 for a total of 44 and just recently field a new GBI software upgrade. Next, the line of effort to provide trained and ready Army missile and, missile and defense forces. 
Meeting the increasing demand for air missile defense force is one of our toughest challenges, and I'm looking forward to this panel's insights on readiness for the future fight while meeting the high demand of current operations. At the heart of our force are our soldiers, and it's imperative that we identify how to develop human capital and build resiliency and readiness into the future force. I've recently mentioned the training effort we have ongoing for Maneuver Shore Ad. Additionally, last year, the 263rd AAMDC implemented the National Guard Patriot Training Program to develop Army National Guard air defense staff and planners with knowledge of Patriot operations in a joint environment. And we can't forget readiness from an equipment standpoint. As most of you know, the Army has realized the need to bring additional Avenger sets back to the active component. AMC is providing outstanding support in this effort by inspecting and overhauling legacy Avenger systems that were sitting literally in a field in Leonard County, Pennsylvania, set for disposal in order to create 72 fully functional Avenger sets to support UCOM mission requirements. The last line of the effort is build partner capacity and maintain forward presence. I described how the threat capacity exceeds our own many times over. Cooperation with partners is a critical to building and maintaining a cohesive defense and clearly signals the ongoing commitment to those nations. Our panel on this line of effort will provide insights into the importance of building partner capacity, not only from an equipping perspective, but from the standpoints of interoperability, foreign disclosure, and operational execution. Each AAMDC conducts numerous complex, complex combined exercises with their allied partners to help determine how and what capabilities we can leverage and include in pre-operational planning. The AAMDCs are integral to providing joint and combined theater air and missile defense for their combatant commands. The 94th and PACOM, the 10th and UCOM, 32nd and FORCECOM, supporting CENTCOM, and executing missions globally. And the 263rd, conducting operations in CENTCOM, UCOM, and executing the National Capital Region Integrated Air Defense Mission and supported NORTHCOM. These commands and soldiers help to strengthen strategic ties build partnership capacity, increase interoperability, and protect the homeland. The U.S. and Republic of Korea just recently over the last year worked cooperatively to uh, deploy THAAD to South Korea, strengthening the alliance's layered missile defense. The 94th and 32nd WMDCs have been instrumental in establishing this critical capability. And as I mentioned, Avenger, and thanks to AMC's efforts, the Army is ahead of schedule to deliver two Avenger Battalion equipment sets to Europe this year in support of the European Defense Initiative. The personnel and infrastructure to establish an active component Avenger Battalion will follow next year, and the 10th AAMDC is essential to synchronizing this effort. In addition, the 263rd AAMDC is beginning annual rotations of an Army National Guard Avenger battery to Europe this year, along with, a, along with the scheduled Brigade Combat Team rotations. I also want to take a minute to mention Nimble Titan, a unique series of exercises that brings together many allies and partners in a strategic forum to work through the issues of global air and missile defense integration and cross-regional cooperation, exploring collaborative missile defense, synchronizing policy and military initiatives, and identifying potential concepts to enhance cooperation and interoperability. Our next Nimble Titan exercise is on the 12th of March, and we will have 28 nations and international organizations participating, which is a record. That's more than we've ever had. So as I get ready to wrap up my uh, remarks here, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the AMD, or Air Missile Defense Strategy. The current strategy, published in 2012, is derived from the Ar Army guidance to prevent, shape, and win. It provides a framework for achieving the AMD vision and our strategic ends of defending the homeland, defending the force, and protecting critical assets, and assuring access for our forces. It stresses integration across active and reserve component operational forces, modernization components, research development, test, evaluation efforts, and material development. In 2015, waypoint number one to the 2012 Army AMD strategy provided a bridge to a comprehensive revision. So we have started that revision and plan to have a new air and missile defense strategy in 2018. It will focus on the time frame of 2018 to 2028 and will be built upon the National Security Strategy, National Defense Strategy, Missile Defense Review, Army Operating Concept, Multi-Domain Battle, and other current doctrine. 
It will include a holistic dot mill PF review accounting for the changing operational environment, the evolving threat, and emerging technologies, and it will address all domains from mud to space. Today's panel will inform our updated strategy. So the AMD enterprise is making steady progress as we not only see internal to the Army but external through all types of news media and reporting, but we must maintain the forward momentum to outpace the threat. The next AMD strategy will ensure that forward momentum continues. So as I close, I want to show a few slides to focus our attention just for a few moments and hopefully throughout the day on our most important resource, the Air and Missile Defense Warfighter. On this slide, you see Staff Sergeant Nathan Cavanaugh from the 10th AMDC, who participated in the Tobruk Legacy 17, strengthening AMD integration with allies and partners in the UCOM AOR. Tobruk Legacy is a multinational air defense exercise. In 2017, more than 1,800 air defenders from 10 nations participated and trained together. A key objective in 2017 was to show that multiple forces could work together across countries through new surface-based air defense operations centers. On this slide is PFC, on the right side of this slide is PFC Dillon West with the 32nd Double AMDC participating in exercise roving sands 18 at Fort Bliss, Texas. This exercise was just revived after 13 years, after a 13 year break. It provides a combat training center-like evaluation for the 32nd Double AMDC, including elements from all four of its brigades and enablers from other units. This joint exercise also includes Air Force and Marine Corps as enemy air threats. And go back that, on that slide for a minute. So I should hear a hua. Where's J.B. Burns? Yeah, hua. Oh, hua. All right, slide please. This is Specialist Michael Green, the first person in his family to ever serve in the Army, has supported PACOM for the past year and seven months as a THAAD launcher crew member on Guam. Specialist Green is a member of Task Force Talon and the Army's first forward station terminal high altitude air defense battery with a mission to deter and neutralize threats to Guam and support regional homeland defense. And I think that's a pretty good scowl on his face. Staff Sergeant Dustin Williams out of the 263rd AAMDC who was just promoted this month is an air defender in the National Capital Region and has been with the 263rd AAMDC South Carolina Army National Guard for 14 years. Tim, who? The 263rd includes seven air defense battalions and three brigades from five states, including Florida, Ohio, Mississippi, South Carolina, and North Dakota. The second of the 263rd, which I believe is the newest battalion in the Army National Guard, supports the National Capital Region mission today, along with the 174th Brigade from Ohio as the Command and Control Task Force. Slide, please. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Mikowski with the 100th Missile, Missile Defense Brigade provides critical support to the defending the homeland against an ICBM attack. In May of 2017, the soldiers of Echo Crew, who is shown here, oversaw, not only oversaw, but were actually uh, the crew that was on duty that uh, had the first successful intercept of an ICBM using the GM system, a milestone illustrating the advanced capabilities of this weapon system and the soldiers who, in fact, operate it. Slide, please. And Specialist Marvin Pinnock, an engage engagement controller with the 1st Space Brigade, provides no real-time missile warning at the JTAGs in CENTCOM. Last year, JTAGs completed or achieved 20 years of oper operations serving the nation in the warfighter. It's receiving upgrades as technology improves, but its purpose remains the same, to provide effective early warning to our warfighters in order to save lives. So as you participate in your discussions today, I challenge and your, your panels are challenged with questions. Please keep in mind these great soldiers and air defenders that do these missions around the world 24-7 and 365.